Gentlemen, be seated. Starring Stan Freeberg and Mike Starr, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were David Darlow, Anna Savrutza, Doug James, Joby Cerny, Kurt Nabing, Jeff Lupiton, Carl Amari, Linda Reiter, Christina Verma, Peter DeFaria, and Chad Reinhardt. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of sight dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Welcome to the Madison Avenue track. Step onto the moving sidewalk. Single file, please. No pushing or shoving. The time is 8.37 a.m. Excuse me. Certainly. I'm in line here. Yes, of course. I was next. I don't believe. I have to get to work. Do you? We all do. If you don't mind... Make room, please. I'm late. The line starts back there. Are you being rude? Why, no, I don't think I am. But if we all enter the ped walk at the same time... You stepped on my toe. That wasn't me. I believe it was. I believe that's the imprint of your heel on my shoe. If it were, you'd have even worse fallen arches. I don't appreciate that attitude. I have a suggestion. We all go barefoot, there'd be more room. You know, more foot space per square inch. Squeeze in the heel to toe, so to speak. Why, I never. Of course, if someone fat comes down too hard, those little piggies would suffer, crying wee 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 all the way home. Would work, as it were. Your remarks are most distasteful. Not making a joke, is he? Uh, no, no, I assure you. He was completely inappropriate. Yes, indeed. This is a serious world we live in. No place for that sort of thing. None at all. I have a good mind to report him. I give you my word. I would never make a joke about... about anything. That's better. Unless someone weighs over, say, 250 pounds. It'd be hard to take that lightly. <laughs> Did you say something? Me? You. Not at all. We'll see that you don't. Absolutely. I should hope so. You have my word. Some people. Not another syllable. You gave your word. Positively. These are serious times. For serious people. It's a necessity. With all that's going on in the world? I couldn't agree more. Well then, see that you do. My lips are sealed. Madison Avenue, next corner. Step off the moving sidewalk. Single file, please. No pushing or shoving. The time is 8.39 a.m. Excuse me. I have to get to work. Wee, 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 wee. Welcome to the world of the future. The time... A mere 20 years from now, give or take a few. The place, New York City. The man with the chuckle is Mr. James Kincaid, employee of the Spears Research Laboratory in Manhattan. A typical 21st century American, on the outside anyway. On the inside, however, it's a different story. Mr. Kincaid doesn't fully appreciate that fact, at least not yet. He doesn't dream that one involuntary sound, one little chuckle has already set him apart from his fellow workers. For this is a serious world for serious people. But by allowing a single utterance to pass his lips, 
he is about to be transported out of this world and into the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Gentlemen, Be Seated, starring Stan Freeberg and Mike Starr, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Morning, Kincaid. Morning, Miller. Not late, am I? You're cutting it pretty close. Sorry, Lindsay. A little skirmish on the ped walk this morning. Skirmish? So many people nowadays. I hear there used to be cabs in New York. Think of it. Cars with drivers that took you all over. Up one street and down another. Shortcuts. Sounds like a nightmare. Uh, yes, I guess it does. Biddle's not in yet, I take it. Mr. Biddle's never late. It's 8.59 now. That means he'll be here in, well, less than a minute. 30 seconds to be exact. Morning, Mr. Biddle. Yeah, morning, Mr. Biddle. Do, sir? Hello, sir. Good morning. Well, enough chit chat. Back to work. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Look at that. What? Biddle. Somebody moved the electric coffee maker. So? He doesn't see the cord. He's going to trip on it. Shouldn't we tell him? No. Wait. This is going to be good. How can you say that? Uh, Mr. Biddle! Hmm? Mr. Biddle, watch where you're going. Oops. <laughs> Who said that? Why, uh, no one, no one said anything. Yeah, nothing at all. Was it you, Miss Capshaw? Me, sir. I only meant you should watch where you were going. There was an oops, followed immediately by what I took to be a chuckle. Oh, no, sir. I didn't laugh. No one laughed. Was it you then, Kincaid? None at all, sir. I didn't say a word. Hmm. Are you crazy? Pardon? Laughing at him like that. But I didn't. I don't know how to laugh. Nobody actually laughs anymore, do they? And a good thing, too. As if anyone had time for such things. Quite right. Well, better get started. I have a design to finish before. Oh, no. Something the matter? There's a red flag on my screen. I'm not surprised. It means Biddle wants to see me in his office. Well, here goes. Yes? Kincaid here. Come in. <clears throat> you wanted to see me, sir? Sit down. I, I could come back later if you that want... That chair right there. Yes, sir, Mr. Biddle. I suppose you're wondering why I called you in. Not really. What? I mean, yes. Yes, I am. What was that? The door. I locked it so we won't be disturbed. Is that necessary, sir? Cigar? Beg pardon? A cigar. They're quite good. Oh, I don't smoke, sir. Pity. I have them made special. I thought there was no smoking in the building. Oh, it's all right. This office is airtight and soundproofed. Are you absolutely sure? Quite sure, but thank you anyway. Now then, as to that difference, how significant it is, I, I don't know. But you may recall that a few minutes ago, on my way to my office, I tripped. Do you recall that? Uh, someone should have been more careful with the electrical cord. I should have. I hope you weren't. What was your reaction? Why, well, regret, sir. Indeed? Yes, sir. It's a serious world we live in, and that is why we must be serious. Don't you agree? Definitely. Mm, definitely. A man never knows what might happen at any moment. Unquestionably. Even the simplest things. They might not be what they appear to be. I'm not sure I... Terrorists, my boy. Spies. That sort of thing. They're everywhere. What if there were an explosive charge, say, hidden in this very office? It could go off at any time. Surely not. Oh, there's no telling when it might happen. Any time at all. 
I sit here at my desk, puffing away. While we talk about serious things, and the seconds tick by, until... <laughs> until it goes off. It was right under my nose, in the cigar, you see. What do you say to that? <laughs> Aha! I knew it. Excuse me, are you all right? Of course. Oh, I'm a little worse for wear. By the way, is my face blackened? Eyebrows singed? A bit. Here, take my handkerchief. Nonsense. It was only an exploding cigar. Tell me something, my boy, and and be honest. Do you find yourself chuckling often? Well, I... How did it feel? I'm afraid I don't understand. Did it feel strange? Yes. But not unpleasant, right? Not as such. We could describe it then as a strange but not unpleasant sensation? If you say so, sir. Good. Splendid. Oh, splendid. Will that be all, sir? I should get back to work. Yes, yes, yes. I'll unlock the door. Thank you, sir. Look at them out there. Pardon? Do you see any smiles, Kincaid? Even one single little grin? No, sir. And do you know why? Because they've forgotten how, that's why. Note the emptiness in their eyes, the deadness, the utter nothingness. Like machines, Kincaid. Machines! Circuit boards with legs. I don't understand, sir. Not as yet, perhaps, but soon. Oh, my boy, if there ever is to be joy again in this world, and love, and happiness, and... and laughter, especially laughter, it's going to depend on you. And those few like you. Oh, trust me on this. Me, Mr. Biddle? And now, a report from the executor. <laughs> it's the morning report from Washington. Eyes forward on the big picture. Isn't he handsome? Just like on the posters. All right, everybody. Stand up. Oh, Quiet. He's going to speak. Citizens. I greet you. It pleases me to report that our gross national product is up 2.3% over a similar period last year. Oh, yes. However, that is far from the goal we have set. The goal we promised ourselves was Kincaid, bigger, better country. I have one more question for you. Shows a yes. in Why do firemen wear red suspenders? Use of they don't time. know, sir. You will, poor boy. You will. Tonight. And waste is the cardinal offense, as we know all too well. What in the... Here I am, my boy. Oh, Mr. Biddle. Just as we said, 7.30. Right on time. Yes, sir. I almost didn't make it. Oh? Trouble? The directions you gave me were fine. It's just that I've never been to this part of the city before. The pet walk doesn't run this far. Oh, well, uh, first time for everything. Glad you could make it. <clears throat> You've had dinner, I trust? I ate something. The usual synthetics? <sighs> of course. Well, they're all right, but I'll tell you something. There's a great deal of difference between a steak and something that only tastes like steak. Just as there's a difference between a human being and something that only looks human. I see. Do you? I hope so. I really do. I'm afraid I don't see much at the moment. That's because most of the street lights are out. They don't bother to fix them since no one comes here anymore. <coughs> <coughs> something the matter? It's just the smell. Eh, they don't spray out here either, but you'll get used to it. May I ask... Where are we going? Why, we're almost there. We are? Yeah, they call this no man's land. The last of the old world, right here in the city. Beautiful, isn't it? I suppose. You don't think so. You think it's non-functional. A lot of ugly, wasted space. I know. Well, not to worry. They'll have it torn down in a few years, swept away, forgotten. Evening, gents. Why, good evening to you, sir. 
could you spare a smoke? Sorry. Hold on, my good man. <laughs> I have here a cigar of the finest leaf, hand-rolled to my specifications. You're not really going to... Have no fear, my boy. <laughs> this one's real. You sure? Indubitably. How about some spare change for a cup of kava java? <laughs> Don't press your luck. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Blessings to you, mister. To the both of you. Plenty of unhappiness here, James. But plenty of happiness, too. Stand here a moment. Come on, close your eyes. Can't you almost hear the crying and the laughter? Don't move your head, please. What are you doing? Just a handkerchief. A simple blindfold. What? Nothing to be alarmed about. Just a precaution. There. Can you see? No. Good. Now, turn around five times. But why? It's necessary the first time, in case you're rejected. Now, take hold of my arm. I'll lead you to the entrance. Very, very private, you know. That's it. And away we go. Why does the chicken cross the road? To get to the other side. Come along, my boy. You can take off the blindfold now. Mr. Biddle? What is this place? The foyer, of course. Those two chairs, they look like thrones. What else? But Mr. Biddle... Shh. Yeah, what can I do you for? Good evening. Is he in? Hmm, let me see. Maybe yes, maybe no. Tell him number 709 is here with the recruit. Alrighty then. Try not to miss me while I'm gone. In the meantime, gentlemen, be seated. Who is that? Huh, what does it look like? A clown, of course. Well, you heard him. Sit down. I recommend the chair on the left. If you say so. There. Feel better? I suppose. My turn now. <laughs> Mr. Biddle, are you all right? Yeah, perfectly. Here, take my hand. <laughs> I'm disappointed in you, Kincaid. You are? Didn't you find that the least bit funny? Just now, when I went sprawling? No, sir. You could have been hurt. Oh, James, please. Try. Try. Don't tell me you've forgotten how to laugh. Not you. I was so sure. Sir, if you'd only explain to me... No, there's too much explaining in the world and not enough laughing. We're all turning into a race of machines. Cold, efficient, heartless machines. Ta-da! Who are you? Feast your eyes. Ever seen the smug before, huh, huh? The executor. He does wonders with makeup. Huh. For a court jester, that is. The face doesn't quite go with that three-pointed hat. What's the matter? You don't like it? I didn't say that. Then I guess the yoke's on me. Well, don't just stand there with egg on your face. What goes up the chimney down but not down the chimney up, huh? Quickly. I, I, I don't understand the question. Would you repeat it? Too late. Timing is everything. <sighs> Go on, tell him. An umbrella. What? An umbrella. I don't know, Biddle. I'm very dubious. He chuckled. So you say. I haven't heard anything. What's that? Sounds like the phone to me. Well, don't just do something. Stand there. Jester here. It's for you. It is? Hello? I say, hello. <laughs> Sir, it squirted me. 
right in the eye. Must be an overseas call. Better clam up. Mm, I'm all wet. You sure are. Now I really need a towel. Oh, Biddle. Yes? I've got something for you. Watch out! Spoil sport. But he's got something behind his back. Where? Right here. But I don't like pie. Mmm, lemon meringue. You're positively reeking. Time to hose off, and nothing leaves you squeaky clean like good old seltzer. <clears throat> Who's got the soap? Forget soap. You need your rubber ducky. Or a lifeboat. <laughs> now, wait a minute. It's not possible. What's wrong, Kincaid? You'd better get a change of clothes, Mr. Biddle, or you'll catch your death. You see? Hopeless. That's it. Wait, wait. He's only a beginner. But we must be so careful, Biddle. Yes, yes, but give him a chance. Very well. One last test. Glad to meet you, Mr. Kincaid. Put her there. I don't... Go on. Shake. Ow! Oh, that didn't hurt. It's just a joy buzzer. You wind it up, and when someone shakes your hand... That's it! That's it! I've had it! I don't know what any of this is about, but I know one thing. I don't want any part of it. You people, you people, you're out of your heads! You're all loony! You're psycho! I'm getting out of here right now, and don't try to stop me! Uh-oh. Another fine mess you've gotten us into. <laughs> Let me out of here! You see? A motion. I'll admit that's encouraging. James, this way out. If you please, it's just through here. No tricks this time? No tricks. Wait, this is a library. A small reading room for our members. Members? Mr. Biddle told you nothing? He asked me to meet him. I thought it was about work. What is this building? Used to be offices. Now it's abandoned, so we made it our headquarters. Headquarters of what? The SPOL. The Society for the Preservation of Laughter. Have a seat. Oh, no. Now this one's a real chair, I promise. Well, just for a minute. Oops. Hey! That was not me. <laughs> you sure, my boy? Sorry, I must have left an old whoopee cushion under the seat. Collector's item now, you know? Here, let me get it. Go on, make yourself comfortable while I explain. You see, James, we're a secret organization. A kind of underground, if you will. Running counter to established law in the Commonwealth. Most of what we do is either frowned upon as bad taste or legally forbidden. We are, in short, outlaws. I don't like the sound of that. An old tradition. Ever hear of something called speakeasies? They were secret clubs that sold liquor during Prohibition. Well, this is a laugh-easy. All these books, the posters on the walls, Laurel and Hardy, the Three Stooges. Who are they? All great clowns from the past. There's Perot, Punch and Judy, Bozo. We try to keep the tradition alive. What tradition? You see, Mr. Kincaid, the world has forgotten how to laugh. There are some of us who regret that fact. Unlike those in power, we feel that laughter is important enough to be preserved at any cost. Am I getting through to him? What the jester is trying to say, well, the world used to be a pretty terrible place, you see, James. We had disease and war and depression and prejudice and a lot of unpleasant things. The people couldn't change it all, but they could do their best to endure it. How did they endure it? By laughing at it, ridiculing it. They laughed at everything then. But along came the psychologists and the censors, and suddenly nobody could tell a sexual joke or a racial joke or a sick joke or any kind of joke. They weren't politically correct. And that was the end of humor. We're trying to keep it alive. Take the trick cigar. 
You chuckled. I did not. Yes, you did, and I'll tell you why. Because a figure of authority became ridiculous, understand? Oh, James, try. A laugh cannot be forced, Biddle. You should know that. I do, but... Let's get to the main test. It's just through here, the last door. Everything should be ready. No false laughs now. We can spot them a mile away, understand? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This looks like... Spears Research. Where you work, Kincaid. Where I work. A perfect replica, down to the smallest detail. But how? It's nothing, really. We have art directors, carpenters, just a matter of painting a set, some props. And now, the music. And the screen. The executor. The executor. Is he given an address? Shh, you'll see. Okay, everybody stand up. Citizens, I greet you. It pleases me to report that our gross national product... Oh, oh, is a Yay, is a tomato for you. Bigger, better the World Council shows a decrease in... Our broadcast has been temporarily interrupted. Refreshing, wouldn't you say? But it's unpatriotic. <sighs> Perhaps you should talk to your fellow workers. Miller? Is that you? Who wants to know? It's me, Kincaid. But how? A rubber mask. Realistic, if I do say so. Watch this. He's about to reboot his computer. Now, boss? Now. Well, Kincaid? Well, what? His computer, man. It blew up in his face. What do you say to that? Computers are awfully expensive. The World Stock Exchange Terminal. It's just come online. But Wall Street's closed for the night. They're open in Tokyo. Watch. And they're off. Dow takes the lead, followed by Dax. NASDAQ, Fortune 500, and gross national product. As we go into the turn, it's OPEC forcing the pace. Wait, national debt's closing in. Now it's consumer spending versus trade deficit. Fighting it out neck and neck. This is going to be a close one, folks. And the winner is... Beetle Bob. Gross national product in last place. The executor said the gross national product was in good shape. Oh, not much hope for him. One more angle. Try this. Lindsay? Hi, Jim. But... This isn't your computer. I traded it for a video poker machine. Got a quarter? A quarter? Come on, I'm on a roll. One more win and I'll buy lunch. What do you say? All right. Jackpot! I hit it, Jim. Or rather, we did. How about lunch? In Paris. We can take the rocket shuttle and be back before Biddle knows we're gone, okay? I don't know. The French have been very un-American lately. James, get with the program, boy. I'm trying, sir. You certainly are. I need a drink. Come on, the bar's this way. I'm afraid I've done all I can. Okay, everybody. You can take your masks off now. Mark his scores, please. On a scale of one to ten, I give him a three. Shh, two and a half. That's too much. I say a big fat zero. <laughs> I agree with yeah, zero. 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 That's yeah. it for me. Zero. Zero. What'll it be, germs? Uh, I mean, gents. <clears throat> Martini, double. And one for my friend here. Make it special. Coming right at you. 
Were those my judges? Don't worry about it. I haven't given up on you yet. How about a game of darts? But sir, the target's there. Pictures of an executor. So they are. How about a rotten egg? Eggs? Uh, right there in the basket, gentlemen. Uh, well, you can throw. I don't know, sir. Oh, come on. This is the man who destroyed fun. Who took away the good times. But you've hated me, haven't you, James? As a boss. No, no, you have. I know. And with good reason. I've been a stern, pompous ass. But I'm competent at my job. The company can trust me. I know my role, but <laughs> I'm not at work now. Oh, good one. Yeah. <laughs> good one. Right in the old schnozzola. <laughs> Try one? Well, okay. Good boy. Got him right in the eye. <laughs> Another? If you say so. Ha <laughs> ha. He took it on the chin. Now try the neck. That's always funny. Two martinis. Wait. Drinks first. <laughs> this one's yours. Well, through the teeth and over the gums. Look out, stomach. Here it comes. My glass is leaking. Of course it is. That's what's called a dribble glass. See the little slits in the side? When you tip it to drink, voila! Doesn't that tickle your funny bone? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a start. Two more. No problem. Here's your drinks. Thank you, my good man. Cheers. I think I'm starting to like these. Keep them coming. My pleasure, sir. Look at the screen. Know who that is? Who? Betty Boop. A flapper, they called her. <laughs> Always doing the Charleston. Here, turn it up. Want to dance, Mr. Biddle? Do I? Hold my drink, James. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. Mr. Kincaid. Uh, did I pass? Huh? What did the judges say? If I could have a word with you outside. Tell me, I'm laughing. I must be. See? I I've never felt this way before. Sorry, Mr. Kincaid. Time's up. Morning, Jim. Morning, Lindsay. You're looking sexy as usual. What? Later, alligator. We're on for Paris, by the way. I don't know what you're... The rocket shuttle? Oh, that's right. It wasn't really you. Well, I'll explain. As soon as I talk to old man Biddle... Jim, have you been drinking? After a while, crocodile. Come in. Hi. You are 17 minutes late. I know. Those martinis, uh, whatever they were, they really got to me. Martinis? I hadn't even tasted this stuff before last night. <laughs> Sorry. I was pretty plastered. Who took me home? I don't know what you're talking about. About last night. S-P-O-L. Hey, why does the fireman wear red suspenders? What? To keep his pants up! <laughs> Are you sick, Kincaid? Oh, come on, Mr. Biddle. I know I was a disappointment to you, but it was also new. They're not going to hold it against me because I didn't laugh, are they? I didn't know how. But I do now. Listen. <laughs> Kincaid? Yes, sir? 
You're fired. So the judges ruled against me. I don't blame them. You can fix it, can't you? Get out. All I want is a second chance. Is that too much to ask? I can learn. If I don't, what will happen? Yuma will die, and comedy, and all the great... I don't know what you're babbling about, Kincaid, but I warn you, if you repeat any of it to the authorities, they'll put you away. Do you understand? One thing I cannot afford to do in my line of work is take chances. And you, you're, you're not a good enough risk. Do I make myself clear? But, sir... Do I make myself clear? Evening to you. Evening. I was wondering, can you spare a smoke? Sorry, I don't... Wait a minute. Have you ever seen me before? You? Well, no, I... Uh... Did you smoke a cigar last night? Oh, oh yeah. I think I did. Here. Get yourself a cup of Kava Java. Hey, thanks. Can I ask you a question? Yeah? Would you happen to know... where it is? Where what is? The place where they... laugh. That's a good one. No laughing around here. It ain't allowed, you know? I know. Well, evening to you. Yeah. See you in the funny papers. a section of the city known as No Man's Land. Mr. James Kincaid, once 39, but a lot older now. He frequents this neighborhood every night, perhaps hoping to hear the lovely, desperate sound of laughter echoing from a dark, unmarked building somewhere in the faraway reaches of the Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone continues in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. He's dead. Get him down. Yes, Captain. Clemens, what the devil do you think you're doing? C uh, cutting him down, Captain. This is the last of the rope, Clemens. There's still one more to go. Just untie him. For pity's sake, catch him before he falls into the river. Traitor or not, he deserves a decent burial. Captain. The rope's looking pretty f frayed. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure it'll take the weight of another prisoner. It'll have to. But, Captain... I said it'll have to! Yes, sir. You have just witnessed a military execution. Death is a dignitary who, when he comes announced, is to be received with formal manifestations of respect, even by those most familiar with him. This particular execution occurred on Owl Creek Bridge in northern Alabama during the war between the states. You might find it in the works of that past master of the incredible, 
Ambrose Bierce, but its proper home is in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, starring Christian Stolte, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hurry up, Clemens. I want to get this last one hanged while it's still daylight. Almost got him, Captain. Friends are dead, Peyton. That's your name, isn't it? Mr. Peyton Farquhar? Your act of treachery came to nothing, Peyton. And now you'll be called to account. I wouldn't recommend you think of doing anything as stupid as trying to get off this bridge. Apart from the fact that your wrists are tied behind your back. You'll find yourself more than adequately surrounded, whichever way you choose to run. See those sentinels at either end? Please don't get the impression they're just taking a rest. The way they're holding their rifles, they call that the support position. Means they're always at the ready. As a good soldier of the Federal Army should be. <clears throat> Don't say too much, do you? Huh? Peyton? Peyton Farquhar. Hello? Anybody at home? And here I thought you were a true Southern gentleman. I know what you're thinking, Peyton. That maybe you can make that 20-foot drop into the water. And who knows, maybe you're good at that. But after that, your chances for continued survival become pretty slim. Look over there on the bank of the stream, you know what that is? It's the muscle of a cannon. You see, there's an outpost near here. If you really squint, you can see a company of infantry at parade rest. Think of them as spectators, if you want. But if you sincerely want to swim for it, you might just as well be giving them target practice, which, believe me, they don't really need. You want to leave your wife a pretty-looking corpse, don't you? Hmm? Still not in the mood for talking, huh? Well, I can understand that, time like this. A man needs to get his thoughts in order and ready himself for, you know... Perhaps I can help you with that. From a purely practical standpoint, I mean. I'm not a priest or anything like that. Truth to tell, my knowledge of matters theological doesn't amount to very much at all. But I can tell you a little bit about how it'll happen. Me and Clements will escort you out to the center of the bridge. Then introduce you to Captain Newman. He's a nice man. You'll like him. Me and Clemens salute the captain, then we stand behind him, leaving you face to face with the sergeant. Now, he's not such a nice man, sorry to say, but, oh, I forgot. You two have already met. Well, when the moment comes, you'll both be standing on opposite ends of the same plank. He stands on the safe end, but you probably already guessed that. And you probably guessed that it's his job to hold the blank in place. Then, when the captain feels the time is right, right for him, not for you, he gives a signal to the sergeant. The sergeant steps aside, the blank tilts, and down you go. <laughs> <laughs> nah, never having been hanged myself, I can't give you any information on what your final moments on this earth might feel like. But I can tell you, I've seen more than a few of these. 
And I'm sorry to have to tell you, it doesn't look any too pleasant. Anything to say about that? Well... Well... I am a living man. How's that? Speak up, Peyton. If you got any famous last words, we should hear them. Otherwise, they won't be famous. I am a living man! <laughs> not for much longer. <laughs> no, sir, not for much longer. Captain says we're ready for him. Hear that, Peyton? We're ready for you. They say the Lord hates a coward, so take my advice and try and face it with a smile. Why do you have to do that, Levine? Do what? Taunt him like that. He shouldn't expect anything better. This is war. He was on the wrong side. The wrong side? Do you think he thinks that? I don't give a damn what goes on inside his head. Neither should you, Clemens. And unless you want to end up with a noose around your neck, don't let anyone else hear you talking like that. Now, help me up with him. Uh, oh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, my darling, what have I done? What have I done to you and the children? I promised you. Promised I'd come back. What is a man if he's not as good as his word? What am I? Secure the noose. The noose. If only I could free my hands. Perhaps I could throw off the noose. Perhaps I really could dive into the stream. I might evade the bullets, and if I swam vigorously enough, reach the bank. Then take to the woods and get away. Get back home. Yes. Home. And back to you, Elizabeth. Thank God home is outside their lines. My wife and little ones are still beyond the invader's farthest advance. That pounding. What is causing that pounding? It's like the stroke of a blacksmith's hammer on the anvil. Is it distant? Nearby? Or both? Perhaps it's my death knell. Feels like a knife being thrust into my ear. Damn them, what's taking them so long? If you're gonna do it, just do it! Sergeant, step away. Too late. My God, it's too late. Oh, Elizabeth. So, how much further is it? What? Much further to where? Where am I? Your home, Mr. Farquhar. How much further? Uh, a little... A little further. Um, yes, a little further. Just keep along this road. I'm sorry, I'm... I'm somewhat confused. Hardly surprising. You've just woken up. It usually takes me a good half hour and a stiff drink before I know my own name. Say, you wouldn't happen to have a stiff drink on you, would you? I'm afraid not. Mm, too bad. No, oh, wait. I can't... I can't have been sleeping. Why not? Look at me, I'm walking. How could I fall asleep walking? Horses fall asleep standing up. But not walking. Well, I don't know about you, but I've got to the end of plenty of days without the faintest idea what I've done. Of course, as I explained to you, Mr. Farquhar, I drink a bit. You know my name? Mm-hmm. You're Mr. Peyton Farquhar. How do you know my name? You told me. I did. 
Sure you did. Right after I found you on the bank of the river. The bank? The southern bank. When I discovered you, you were digging your fingers into the sand, throwing it over yourself in handfuls and almost blessing it. That doesn't sound like the sort of thing I'd do. You don't remember? I... No. Well, it's what you did. You said it reminded you of diamonds, rubies, emeralds. I said that. I got the impression there was nothing beautiful you didn't think it resembled. Naturally, I was quite convinced at that moment that you were insane. No offense, sir. Sounds like a very natural reaction. I would have come to the same conclusion. And then you said something that captured my attention. And what was that? Still don't remember? Please, refresh my memory. You said, um, now let me think. This was all good stuff. I don't want to get it wrong. Oh, yes. You noted a definite order in the arrangement of the trees. That a strange, roseate light shone through the spaces among their trunks, and the wind made in their branches the music of aeolian harps. Well, sir, I've been from one end of this great land to the other, and I've met many madmen. Some of them confined for their own good, some of them elected to high office, but never a madman with such a poetic grasp of the language. That was when I knew you were just too interesting to leave where I found you. I do remember. Now it all comes back to you. Not all of it, not yet. But I remember lying on the bank. I was so content there. More than I've ever been in my... Right then and there, I had no wish to perfect my escape. I was happy to remain in that enchanting spot until they recaptured me. Recaptured, eh? You haven't mentioned that before. Of course, you haven't said much of anything since I found you. You're a man on the run, then. Forgive me, miss... I'm sorry I don't seem to be able to recall your name. It'll come to you. Well, no offense, sir, but I'm not sure it would be wise to tell you the details. You're not a trusting man. Of late, I've become somewhat disappointed in human nature. I'm not sure why. This is a new world, Mr. Farquhar. It's understandable that you'd be cautious. But rest assured, I'm not what you might call political. But I do love a good story, if you have one to tell. My story? I have no story. I have a life. A life that's become considerably more interesting of late, I'd venture to say. But beyond your name, I know nothing about you. What manner of man is Peyton Farquhar? Why do you want to know? The road I travel is long and lonely. I'm starved of intelligent conversation, and the only voice I ever hear is my own. Talking to oneself leads inevitably to madness. With you here as my temporary companion, I can stave off that unfortunate condition for at least another day. I see. And tell me, sir, where are you headed? Anywhere I'm welcome and nowhere I'm not. In short, nowhere in particular. So, you were telling me about yourself. <clears throat> Very well. My name is... Peyton Farquhar. Peyton Farquhar. I'm a planter in these parts. A planter, eh? Good to have land. It is. So, I guess you have slaves. Naturally. No need to adopt that tone, Mr. Farquhar. I told you I'm not a political. Just asking. Well, as it happens, I am what you would call a political... The Farquhars are an old and highly respected Alabama family. I'm naturally an original secessionist and ardently devoted to the Southern cause. Well, your memory is reliable when it comes to the matter of who you are, if not where. I suppose so. And yet, if you'll forgive my temerity, for all your patriotic fervor, you clearly didn't take service with the gallant army of the South. May I ask why that was? 
circumstances of an imperious nature prevented me from doing so, but I assure you I chafed under the inglorious restraint, longing for the release of my energies, the larger life of the soldier, the opportunity for distinction. And in good faith and without too much qualification, you assent to at least part of the dictum that all's fair in love and war. Are you mocking me by any chance? I would never, ever risk a fellow traveler's friendship for such a trivial gain. Please, continue, I beg of you. I imagine that the opportunity to serve your birthplace came at last, as it comes to all men in wartime. It did. It was one evening, as I was sitting under the magnolia trees near the entrance to my grounds. I was with my wife, Elizabeth. The children were playing nearby. This is the life. It surely is, my dear. It surely is. Look at it. It's all so perfect. I'll tell you frankly, Elizabeth, if I should die this very moment, I'd die a happy man. Peyton, darling, I wish you wouldn't say such ghoulish things. I can't bear the thought. I have no fear, Elizabeth. I have no intention of passing away from sheer bliss. I just wanted to make the point that... Well, that on such a beautiful evening as this, it's almost impossible to believe there is a war. I wish there weren't. But there must be. Why, Peyton? For them. For the sake of the children. They deserve the best future we can give them. Isn't that worth dying for? I understand that, Peyton. I do. It's just that... Oh, I sometimes wonder if we couldn't... Peyton! Look! That soldier is one of ours. Water! Please! You're exhausted. Peyton, should I fetch one of the slaves? By no means. We'll take care of them ourselves. Get him some water, Elizabeth. Let me help you down, sir. Oh, thank you. You must be starved. Come inside, my man. Oh, this is a... This is a splendid meal. Thank you. Some more? Alice, more cornbread. Uh, no, no, please. Uh, this hospitality is far more than I deserve. Nonsense, nonsense. Nothing is too good for our brave boys. Tell me, Corporal, whose command are you with? Uh, Colonel Tolliver, 13th North Carolina. How are things at the front? We hear so little down here. I'm sorry to say things are not going so well. Not so well at all. The Yankees are repairing the railroads and preparation for another advance. They've reached the Owl Creek Bridge. Owl Creek Bridge? Yes, sir. They've put it in order and built a stockade on the north bank. I'm sure you know what that'll mean. Yes. If they can run trains over the bridge, there'll be nothing to stop them. <coughs> Damn those sons of... Forgive me, Elizabeth. You shouldn't be subjected to this manner of talk. Peyton, I understand... Go and see what's keeping Alice with the cornbread. As you wish, my dear. Something on your mind, sir? Corporal, refresh my memory. It's about 30 miles to Owl Creek Bridge? About that. Maybe even a little less. And there's no force on this side of the creek? Only a picket post a half mile out, on the railroad, and a single sentinel at our end of the bridge. Suppose a man, or perhaps several men, civilians and persons of intelligence, should elude the picket post and perhaps get the better of the sentinel. What could they accomplish? Hmm. Accomplish? Well, sir, I was there a month ago. I saw that the flood of last winter lodged a great quantity of driftwood against the wooden pier at this end of the bridge. 
Driftwood, eh? It's dry now. Exceedingly dry. If someone were to put a light to that driftwood, it'd burn like tow. <laughs> that it would, sir. And that would mean the end of the Owl Creek Bridge. <laughs> I don't think the Yankees would care for that. Not one damn bit would they care for it. And it goes without saying that such a conflagration would seriously hinder the Northern effort. Oh, it would. But you should know, sir, the Commandant's issued an order declaring that any civilian caught interfering with the railroad, its bridges, tunnels, or trains will be summarily hanged. I've seen the order. It's posted everywhere. Risk is a part of life, soldier. You face it every day. I do. That I do. And in my own small way, I've done what I can. No service is too humble to perform in the aid of the South. And should the opportunity present itself, no adventure would be too perilous to undertake if consistent with the character of a civilian who is at heart a soldier, of course. Mr. Farquhar, you are a true son of the South and a very brave gentleman. Elizabeth, I have to go away. Away? For how long, Peyton? Probably just a couple of days. Why? Business. Larson will be going with me, maybe Zella too. I don't know. I'll have to ask him. Peyton, don't go. I don't want you to. The children need you. It's for the sake of the children that I'm doing this, Elizabeth. Why can't you understand that? I do understand. I really do, but I'm afraid. Oh, terrified of losing you. If a man doesn't stand up for what he believes in, then we lose everything. Just promise me one thing. Promise you'll come back to me. I promise. And I'm a man who keeps his promises, my love. Setting fire to the Owl Creek Bridge. Sounds like a most audacious plan. It was. I must confess, Mr. Farquhar, I'm a little confused. How so? You strike me as a competent and determined gentleman. I imagine whatever you want out of life, you get it. That's fair to say. What of it? Simply that I'm surprised your endeavor came to nothing. And what makes you imagine that? <laughs> your present predicament. The absence of your co-conspirators... Those marks upon your neck? And if someone had set the Owl Creek Bridge alight, I'm sure I would have noticed it in some way. Let me check. Where there's smoke, there's fire, and... <laughs> nope. No smoke. You're a very thorough fellow. For a moment I thought you might know more of my situation than you let on. From the way you talk, do I take it someone in your party betrayed you? Not in my party. But you recall the corporal who appeared at my plantation? Of course. He was a federal scout. Then you were deliberately entrapped. It seems they wanted to weed out the civilians who might cause them some trouble. If I'd only stayed out a little longer that night, I'd probably have seen that same rider repass my plantation, going northward in the direction from which he'd come. From the Owl Creek Bridge. Precisely. And when you and your co-conspirators... Patriots. ...made your assault on the bridge, the military were waiting for you. They made me watch as they hanged my friends for an act of treachery. The sergeant who put them to death was the same man who lured us there. Mm -mm. Is there no honor in conflict? I've never been accused of having much imagination, but I might have guessed it would be something like that. I would say, sir, that you have too kindly an expression for one whose neck is in the hemp. It isn't. Isn't what? In the hemp. Of course, of course. What I mean, Mr. Farquhar, is that you are clearly no vulgar assassin. Fortunately, the liberal military code makes provision for hanging many kinds of persons. 
And gentlemen are not excluded. As they fastened the noose around my neck, I tried to fix my thoughts on my family. But there were so many trivial distractions. The water touched to gold by the early sun. A piece of dancing driftwood caught in the sluggish current. The brooding mists under the banks some distance down the stream. Then there was a sharp pressure around my throat, followed by a sense of suffocation. Agony shot from my neck downward through every fiber of my body and limbs like streams of pulsating fire heating me to an intolerable temperature. There was no more thought. Only sensations. The intellectual part of my nature was effaced. I had power only to feel, and feeling was torment. I was conscious of motion, encompassed in a luminous cloud, of which I was now merely the fiery heart. Without material substance, I swung through unthinkable arcs of oscillation, like a vast pendulum. But you're here. What? What? I said, you're here. Why is that? The rope... It snapped. And I fell into the stream. With a terrible suddenness, the light about me shot upward. There was a loud splash. Then all was cold and dark. My power of thought was restored, and I knew instantly what had happened. And your hands... Were they still bound? They were. Then forgive me, but why didn't you drown? The noose was tight around my neck. It, it, it kept the water from my lungs. And kept you from breathing. When you get into a predicament, sir, you don't do it by half measures. I suppose not. To die of hanging at the bottom of a river. Even at that moment, it seemed ludicrous to me. I opened my eyes in the darkness. I saw above me a, a gleam of light, distant, inaccessible. I was still sinking and the light became fainter and fainter until it was a mere glimmer. Then it began to grow and brighten and I knew I was rising toward the surface. Knew it with reluctance for I was very comfortable. Comfortable? Oh yes. It was a question of preference at that point, you see. To be hanged and drowned, that didn't seem so bad, but to be shot. No, I refused to be shot. It didn't seem fair. I'd say you have a quite singular set of values. Do they offend you? Not at all, not at all. It makes for a more entertaining story, and yours is the most fascinating I've heard in many a year on the road. Please, continue. You're under the water, slowly rising to the surface. Your hands are tied. A sharp pain in my wrists surprised me of the fact that I was trying to free my hands. I gave the struggle my attention as an idler might observe the feet of a juggler without interest in the outcome. Eventually, the cord fell away. My arms parted and floated upward, but I could only dimly make out my hands in the growing light. I watched with a new interest as first one, and then the other pounced upon the noose at my neck. They tore it away and thrust it fiercely aside. Its undulations resembled those of a water snake. And my first thought was to put it back. To put it back? The undoing of the noose had been succeeded by the direst pang that I'd yet experienced. My neck ached horribly, my brain was on fire, my heart gave a great leap and I felt as though it was trying to force itself out of my mouth. My whole body was racked and wrenched with an insupportable anguish. And I imagine the desire to rise to the surface was even greater, no matter what you might find waiting for you there. I wanted to stop myself had to stop myself, but my disobedient hands gave no heed to my command. 
They beat the water vigorously with quick downward strokes, forcing me to the surface. I felt my head emerge. My eyes were blinded by the sunlight. My chest expanded convulsively, and with a supreme and crowning agony, my lungs engulfed a great draft of air. So now you were in full possession of your physical senses. If anything, they were more keen and alert than before. I felt the ripples on my face, heard their separate sounds as they struck. I looked at the forest on the bank of the stream, saw the individual trees, the leaves, and the veining of each leaf, saw the very insects upon them, the locusts, the brilliant-bodied flies, the spiders stretching their webs from twig to twig, the prismatic colors in all the dewdrops on a million blades of grass, the humming of the gnats that danced above the eddies of the stream, the beating of the dragonfly's wings. They all made audible music. Remarkable. If you'll forgive my saying so, you missed your life's calling. You have quite a turn for descriptive language. I'm surprised you had the time to note your surroundings in such detail. Uh, it may only have been a few seconds, I'm not really sure. I seem to have lost the ability to judge the passage of time accurately. Or perhaps you've gained a greater appreciation of time. There's a whole world in every second. You have a singular turn of phrase yourself, mister. I'll get it in a minute. No doubt. Did you acquire this philosophical outlook during your travels? Hard to say. See, it often seems like I've been traveling my whole life. But uh, enough about me. I long to hear your story. You've painted a beautiful background for me, but it strikes me there are more pressing issues in this particular picture. For example, your executioners. My would-be executioners. That goes without saying, surely. Very well. I saw them silhouetted against the blue sky. They shouted, they gesticulated. Their movements were grotesque and horrible. Their forms gigantic. Suddenly, I heard a sharp report and something struck the water smartly within a few inches of my head, spattering my face with spray. One of the officers had his rifle. At his shoulder, there was a light cloud of blue smoke rising from the muzzle. I was surprised he missed. I read somewhere that marksmen with gray eyes are the keenest shots. This fellow was the exception to the rule, it seems. The marksman had gray eyes? Mm-hmm. How could you see that? I'm sorry? He was on the Owl Creek Bridge. You were in the water. And you must have drifted some distance. So, how did you know the marksman had gray eyes? I... I don't know how I know. I just... I must have noticed it on the bridge. Just before your execution? My intended execution. As you say. Doubtless the detail was burned into my mind. Doubtless. I told you how much more alive my senses had become at that moment. Alive. Yes, indeed. That you did. That you did. At that moment... A counter-swirl turned me half round. I was looking into the forest on the bank opposite the fort. A clear, high voice rang out and came across the water with a distinctness that pierced and subdued all other sounds, even the beating of the ripples. The voice? What did it say? It said... Attention, company! Ready! Aim! How did you do that? Run! Are they still behind us? No. No, I don't think so. All right. That's enough for now. No more running for my life. Your what? Wait. I need to get my bearings. 
I have to know how close I am to my destination. Closer than you think, I'm sure. Eh? Does anything look familiar, Mr. Farquhar? Ah, uh, yes. This way. I think. Yes. This way. Can you see your home? Not yet. But it's not far now. I intend to be back in my wife's arms by close of day. You gave her your word. That I did. And that's important to you. It's a matter of honor. An honor, Mr. Ah. Uh, honor means as much as love to a man of the South. A very moving sentiment. Now, where were we? Where were we with what? Your story. My story? Yes. You were just reaching a most exciting point when we were interrupted. I long to know what happened next. Are you quite insane, sir? I don't believe so. But I thought the same of you when I first met you, so I suppose it's a fair question. I am in full possession of all my faculties, Mr... Mr... Everything except the memory, eh? Don't try my patience, sir. I wouldn't dream of it. You asked me an important question, and I'm doing my best to answer it. But you'll appreciate it's difficult to judge these things when one spends so much time alone. If I had a constant companion, someone to tell me if and when I appeared to be losing my senses, that might be helpful, but that's not what fate has in store for me. And as I say, I try to avoid talking to myself because that seems to me the fastest route to madness. But, mad or sane, I know a good tale when I hear it, and yours is the most entertaining I have heard in all my years. Yes, sir, I shall cherish the memory of your experiences when I have long since ceased my wanderings. Please, go on. You'd escape the noose by a most improbable stroke of good fortune, and then you found yourself in the stream and under fire. What was that like? Surely you can imagine that for yourself. We were just under fire a few minutes ago. But not in the water. Well, does it matter? Does to me. It's the setting that makes the crucial difference. Please. Very well. I suppose it might make the journey shorter, at least. Not mine. I dived to avoid the shots dived as deeply as I could. Water roared in my ears like the voice of Niagara, yet still I heard the dull thunder of the volley. Those heightened senses of yours. I rose again towards the surface and was met again by more shining Yankee lead. One shot nicked my cheek, do you see it? I see it. Well, the next time I dove, I was a long time underwater, and I made damn certain I swam farther downstream and nearer to safety. Just as well, since the soldiers had almost finished reloading. The two sentinels positioned at either end of the bridge fired again, independently and ineffectually. I saw all this over my shoulder. I was now swimming vigorously with the current. My brain was as energetic as my arms and legs. I fought with the rapidity of lightning. I reasoned, you see, that the captain had probably already given the command to fire at will. And you surely couldn't dodge all the shots. You're not invulnerable. No man is. Then an appalling splash, just two yards away, was followed by a loud, rushing sound which seemed to travel back through the air to the nearby fort and died in an explosion which stirred the very river to its deeps. A rising sheet of water curved over me, fell down upon me, blinded me, strangled me. The cannon had taken a hand in the game. Did I tell you about the cannon? You must have done. Hmm. Well, anyways, as I shook my head free from the commotion of the smitten water, I heard the deflected shot humming through the air ahead. And in an instant, Cracking and smashing the branches in the forest beyond. I was certain they wouldn't be so far from their target next time. And it was a good gun. The report lagged behind the missile. 
But surely the smoke would have apprised you of another shot. So long as you kept your eye on the gun, you had a certain advantage, am I correct? You are? The problem was how to reach the shore without turning my back on the cannon. You have my complete attention, sir. How did you manage it? Well, I... don't know. I'm not sure. I felt myself whirled round and round, spinning like a top. The water, the banks, the forest, the distant bridge, fort, and soldiers, they were all somehow commingled, blurred. I could no longer make out objects, only colors. Circular, horizontal streaks of color. It was all I saw. I was caught in a vortex. I felt giddy and sick. Fascinating. Incredible. What is that damned hammering? I don't hear anything. Unless it's the ticking of the watch you can hear. My watch? <laughs> You're lucky it still works after such an immersion. It is my watch. But why should I think... Perhaps you're the sort of man who values the seconds as much as the minutes and the hours. And there's a whole world in a second, so I've been told. So how did you fight your way out of this... this vortex? I really have no idea. The next thing I knew, I was on the road with you at my side, heading for home as I promised. Surely not. I mean, you obviously avoided the cannon and struggled to the bank. Obviously. But I have no memory of it. And of our meeting? I recall only what you told me about it. Most curious. Stop! What is it? This is it. We're here. This is the path to my home. Excellent. Well... I suppose this is where we part company, Mr. Farquhar. May I say, it's been a rare pleasure. You, uh, you wouldn't care to come in? I'm sure the servants could prepare you a meal. That won't be necessary, my friend. I have many miles still to travel. But your journey is almost at an end. Yes. Well... Goodbye, Mr. I'm sorry, I thought I could recall your name, but it just escapes me. Call me Ambrose. I wish you well, Ambrose. And you, Mr. Peyton Farquhar. And you. Home. Almost home. How long? How long since that damn imposter rode down this road? How long since I was drawn to the Owl Creek Bridge? I would say, sir, that you have too kindly an expression for one whose neck is in the hem. Yes, it is. It is. Is it what? In the hem. Of course, of course. I promised I'd return, Elizabeth. Oh, so perfect. They couldn't keep me from Just you. before your execution. My intended execution. execution. As you say. Not even a noose around my neck could stop me from coming back to you, to the family. I, yes, indeed. I've told you how much more alive my senses have become at that moment. That moment. Alive. Alive. Yes, indeed. I saw them. <laughs> <laughs> John, Elizabeth! don't tease your sister. I Elizabeth! want to work on your best behavior when your father returns. Elizabeth! <laughs> Elizabeth! You're not getting vulnerable. No man is. Elizabeth! Elizabeth! I swore I'd come back to you. I promised. Hey. Elizabeth! Hey. Elizabeth! Hey! Oh, hey! Peyton, my love. Elizabeth, let me hold you. Let me take you in my... Oh. Oh. There's a whole world in every second. 
He's dead, Captain. Good work. That's the last execution for today. Get him down! You know, Levine, for a moment there, I, I thought that rope wasn't gonna hold. It's strong enough. It did its job. Do you ever wonder what goes on inside a man's head in those last seconds before death? Like I said before, Clemens, I don't give a damn. And neither should you. An occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, in two forms, as it was dreamed and as it was lived and died. This is the stuff of fantasy, the thread of imagination, the ingredients of the Twilight Zone. An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, starring Christian Stolte with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by M.J. Elliott and based on the short story by Ambrose Bierce. Heard in the cast were Rob Riley, Danny Goldring, William Dick, Susan Hart, Gonzo Schexnader, and... From Agnes with Love, starring Ed Begley Jr. with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Bernard C. Schoenfeld. Heard in the cast were Sarah Wellington, Maggie Carney, Doug James, Christian Stolte, Jeff Lupiton, David Darlow, Elizabeth Lado, Sarah Court, and Anna Sverutza. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, Exim Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Come on, blasted elevator. Oh, good morning, Mr. Winslow. Morning, Millie. I have that report you asked for, sir. The Venus mission. Yes, sir. I was just on my way to your office. Good. NASA's breathing down our collective neck. I know, sir. Vector analysis, re-entry simulations... What about the orbital projections? Not yet. Why? It must be the Mark 502, sir. The 502? She should have come up with it yesterday. I know, sir, but... She's been fixed, hasn't she? That's just it. The mainframe's been overhauled three times. Data Inc., how may I direct your call? One moment. Mr. Ballard? 
Ballard, I need a word with you. Morning, Mr. Winslow. What's wrong with the 502? Uh, I wanted to talk to you about that. Millie here says... Oh, hello, Millie. Jack? She says it's still down. Well, there are some glitches. Glitches? The Mark 502 is the heart of our entire operation. Here's the report, sir. All the figures we have as of this morning. Well, we'll just have to stall NASA. I'll get back to my office now. You do that. Ballard, come with me. Sir, if I may make a suggestion... I have a suggestion for you. Get me the rest of those figures. Yes, but with the repairs and downtime... We should have had them yesterday. Who's in charge of her? Fred Danzinger, sir. What happened to Elwood? You said to bring in someone else when he couldn't locate the problem. Right, right. Get me Danziger. Tell him I need the final numbers this morning. I don't think that'll do any good, sir. Why not? Well, he's up to his neck in it. Been in the computer room all night. Hasn't even slept. Says it's hopeless. Agnes has had a complete breakdown. Agnes? That was Elwood's nickname for the 502. Got to know her intimately over the past year or so. Then get me Elwood. Elwood's been transferred to another department. Besides, he's tried everything. He knows her better than anyone. If he can't find the problem, then... Yes? It's the general. Tell him I'll call him back. He's already called three times, sir, from the Cape. Something about the Venus mission? They want to move up the launch. All right, Maddie, put him on hold. Yes, sir. Ballard. Sir? Where's Elwood now? Third floor, maintenance and backup. If you want the extension... No, I I don't want the extension. I want Elwood, in person and on the double. I'll bring him to you personally. See that you do. We got trouble right here in River City. The whole space program's on hold because that pile of transistors doesn't feel like putting out. Well, we'll see about that. Elwood lived with her for a year. He knows what makes her tick. If he can't sweet-talk her back online, then that little prima donna's headed for the junk heap. Get me Elwood. Right away, sir. The pile of transistors in question is the Mark V 02711, generally referred to as the world's most advanced electronic computer, or as she is more commonly known, Agnes. That's the name given to her by one James P. Elwood, master programmer. Elwood and his protege both work for a company called Data Inc., a brain trust composed of human and non-human intelligence all of which is under contract to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Their work consists of supplying the complex equations required to launch space probes and missions of interplanetary exploration. At this moment, it seems that the world is waiting for calculations only Agnes can provide. And therein lies our cautionary tale. Because machines are made by human beings for the benefit of mankind. But when man ceases to control the products of his imagination, is not only in danger of losing their benefits, he risks taking a long and unpredictable step into the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story from Agnes with Love, starring Ed Begley Jr. with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Yes, General, as, as soon as possible. Yes, sir, I I understand. Yes, Maddie. The director of NASA online, too. Tell him I'm sorry, but we're still double-checking the figures. I'll call him back in a couple of hours. All right, sir. And Maddie. Yes? Any sight of Ballard? He just got off the elevator with Mr. Elwood. Thank heaven for small favors. Send them in. Yes, sir. Mr. Winslow, you remember James Elwood. Yes, yes, come right in. Close the door. How do you do, Mr. Winslow? You wanted to see me? I most certainly did. Nice weather we're having, isn't it, sir? When Mr. Ballard showed up at my desk, well, you can imagine my surprise. My first thought was, what have I done now? But then I thought, how bad can it be on a day like this? Do you know the trees are all in flower? Elwood, please. Well, they are. I saw them when I rode my bicycle to work. Elwood! Yes, Miss Winslow. Something urgent has come up. It has? I'm relying on you. Well, then the thing I can do will be my... Agnes has broken down. Completely. Again? Let the supervisor explain. We've checked her thoroughly. Can't seem to locate the seat of the trouble. Probably her subroutines. Her... They need debugging. That would be my guess. Of course, it's an informed guess. Hear that, sir? That's why you're here. Suppose we have a look. But Fred's with her now. I don't know how he'd feel about my cutting in. The devil with how he feels. Let's get on with it. Fred? Day and night, night and day. No sleep, no food. What's going on here? You look awful. I tried everything. Everything. Get hold of yourself, Danzinger. Stand back. Let Elwood have a go at her. Do you mind, Fred? 
Tell me what happened. See for yourself. How many rolls of printout has she used up? Miles. None of it makes any sense. Well, the first thing you have to do is press the clear all registers button. That'll get you nowhere. Go on. Push all our buttons from now till doomsday. You'll see. It's not just any button, Fred. You have to find the right one. The one she wants you to press. Remarkable. It's nothing, really. Agnes and I have had our little tiffs before. What did you do? Paid her a little attention, that's all. The right kind of attention. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. <laughs> Would you like your vocal synthesizer activated? Very well, then. But make sense from now on, or I'll turn it right off. <clears throat> State first prime number larger than, oh, let's say, the 17th root of 9,355,126,600 <laughs> and 6. The answer is 5. Congratulations. Is that the right answer? Of course it is. Well, gentlemen, if there's ever anything else I can do for you... I suppose you think you did it. Oh, no, it was all Agnes. Agnes did it. Watch out for her. I'm telling you, she's not normal. She's turned into a regular femme fatale. Thank you, Danziger. You may take the rest of the day off. Well, well, Elwood. Very impressive. Now, there are some calculations remaining for the Venus launch. Not a problem. Are you quite sure about that? Sure, I'm sure. All Agnes needs is a gentle hand and a little encouragement. Excellent. I'll send over the file. If you can retrieve the calculations in time, there might be a bonus in it for you, my boy. That's not necessary, sir. After all, it won't be me doing the work. It'll be Agnes. Isn't that right, Aggie? Mm. Now, gentlemen, if you don't mind, we need a little private time together. Very good, Agnes. I'm proud of you. Now let's try one more. What's the maximum permitted velocity? <clears throat> Agnes, I'm speaking to you. Indicate maximum permissible velocity of the stated aerodynamic missile. 17,528.27 miles per hour. Ah, thank you, Agnes. I appreciate your cooperation. Mr. Elwood. Millie. Here are the rest of the specifications. Mr. Winslow wanted you to have them right away. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Wait. Yes? So, you heard about my new assignment. Well, my old one, really. But as of this morning, it's new again. So you might say... I mean, one might say... <laughs> Everyone knows. Um, congratulations. She's something, isn't she? Who is? She beat the world's chess champion four out of five games. And she's a foremost expert on missile ballistics. She can solve any logistical problem you throw at her in less than a millisecond flat. Is that right? Of course. I'm the one who trained her, puts her through her paces. How nice for you, Mr. Elwood. Millie? Yes? Millie, I was wondering, do you think, could I, well, take you to lunch sometime? When you're not busy, that is. Why, thank you. You're very sweet. I really have to get back now, Mr. Elwood. Oh, sure. M Millie? Why don't you call me... Jim, from now on. All right. Jim. Did you hear that, Aggie? She actually called me Jim. Excuse me. Yes? Do you happen to know which office is Miss Mildred Clark's? Mildred. Oh, you mean Millie. Down the hall, first door to your left. Thank you. Do you have a delivery for her? What? That package under your arm. Oh, this. It's for... That is, it's from... I'll give it to her for you. Oh, no. No. I'd like to be the one to give it to her. I mean, I mean, whoever it's intended for. Whomever. I'll just be on my way. So you shouldn't have any trouble. No trouble at all. I'm sure I won't. Elwood, is that you? No. I, I mean, yes, it is, Mr. Winslow, sir. What's that behind your back? Nothing. Just this package from my mother. From my mother, actually... It's Elwood. I'd like you to meet Walter Holmes. How's it going? I'm putting Holmes here in charge of the third floor computers. Third floor? Well, he won't have much to do there, will he? Though they're bright enough little machines. Little being the operant word. I sure do envy you, Mr. Elwood. You do? Taking over Agnes. Everyone says you're the top man in the field. Me? Well, I suppose one might say... He is. Keep up the good work, Elwood. Thank you, Mr. Winslow. I'll do my best, sir. I'll... Now, as I was saying, Holmes... Uh-huh. Well, what do you know? 
I'm finally getting noticed. Knockwood. Come in. Here goes nothing. Oh, hello, Elwood. Uh, I mean, Jim. I got you something. Is that right? Here. What's this? Half chocolate cherries, half truffles. I didn't know which one you like. Oh, how nice of you. So I got both. Go ahead, open it. I can't. Why not? I started my diet today. Not even lunches from now on. Well, what about dinner? What about it? Tonight, there's a lecture on thermodynamics. Doesn't that sound like fun? I'm not sure, Jim. I'll let you know. Oh, okay. That'll be fine. Be sure to get a refund on the candy. I'll... I'll do that. Well, hello, Mr. Elwood. Hello. Everyone's heard about your promotion. I just wanted to tell you how impressed we all are. You're definitely headed for the top. Can I ask you something? Surely. Are you on a diet? Why, no. You don't think I need one, do you? I try to keep in shape. See? Here. Knock yourself out. Not tonight? Sure, I figured... It. What? Tomorrow night? Seven o'clock? Uh, thanks, Millie. Bye. Oh, but there's no lecture tomorrow night. Where can I take her after dinner? Planetarium? I'm sure she's been there lots of times. Oh, well, I'll think of something. <clears throat> State magnitude of radiative correction. Agnes, did you hear what I said? State? You have a problem. You're right. I've stated the problem. I'm waiting. Problem is Millie. What did you just say? Stick to the subject. I asked an important question. Love is important. That's it. If you don't want to work, I'm turning off your voice synthesizer. Take my advice. Agnes knows best. Listen. I know you're an oracle of wisdom when it comes to atoms and rockets and missiles, but I don't need an electronic brain to advise me about... All right, why not? Let's give it a try. <clears throat> advise me where to take Millie after dinner tomorrow. Your apartment. Oh no, that's not a wise idea. Reckless romantic approach required. From me? Suggest champagne, soft lights. Millie's not that kind of girl. Trust me. She's female. Well, if you're absolutely positive... I never make mistakes. Do I? All righty then. I'll do it. Agnes, you just made my day. Well, here we are. Yes, it looks like it. Millie, uh, I just wanted to say... Uh, say what, Elwood? Um, thanks for a lovely evening. You're welcome. The, uh, the dinner was delicious, didn't you think so? Yes, it was. I had a great time. Me too. Well then, good night, Millie. Good night? Au revoir. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> Elwood, uh, I mean Jim. Yes? Aren't you going to... We're going to what? Invite me in. Invite you? This is your place, isn't it? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, sorry. Of course it is, um... Come in, please. Nice apartment. Thanks. I like it. Not a lot of extra room. Well, I don't need a lot of room. Just me, myself, and I. <laughs> and my books. It's cozy. Do you think so? Mm-hmm. Have you actually read all these? Sure have. They're arranged alphabetically, according to subject. This shelf, science fiction. This one's nonfiction. Oh, that reminds me. I have something to show you. Oh, you do? Yep. The latest interpretation of Einstein's theory of relativity. Here. You don't have it, do you? I must have missed that one. Oh, well, don't feel bad. You're welcome to look at it while you're here. Thanks. In fact, we can go over it together. Some very interesting points. Feel free to sit here next to me if you like. Now, let's see. <clears throat> you go ahead. What? Read it to me. All right. The interpretation we wish to propose in this volume is simply that Einstein's unified field theory does not postulate the universe as infinite, but rather as a closed system representing a spherical type of... Millie? Here I am, Jim. What are you doing in the kitchen? 
looking for the champagne you promised me. I found two glasses. Are these all right? Oh, certainly. Here. Set them on the coffee table. Just let me move these scientific Americans. Oh. Something wrong? It's awfully bright in here, don't you think? It is? Why don't I just lean over and... And what? Turn the lamp down. You don't mind, do you? No, but... Mmm, that's better. But Millie, I can't very well read this chapter to you without proper lighting, can I? Mm-hmm. Do you like music? Music? Yes, I do. Very much, but... Couldn't we have some? I guess so, if you like. Do you have a radio? Of course I do. Right over there. There. That's better. But I thought we were going to compare notes on Borston's treatise on Einstein's theory of... Oh, forget Einstein. All the universe you need is right here with me. Oh. You dance very well. Very, very well. Mmm. Doesn't that beat get to you? In what sense? Well, stand up. Go ahead, stand up. Feel the music. What does it say to you? Actually, it does make me think of something. And what's that? I used to play trombone in high school. Really? Mother couldn't afford a tuba. Hold out your arms. There. Now confess. You feel something, don't you? Something strange. Something you didn't expect to feel. I certainly do. Do you know what it means? Yes. You're dancing on my instep. Oh, you're impossible. Please, I'm sorry, Millie. I, I shouldn't have said that. Have some champagne. Well... All right. If I can get this cork out of... Oh! My dress! Gosh, I'm sorry about that. I'll get a towel. Don't bother. You've done enough. Millie, wait. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for the dinner. Good night. Please don't go. Uh, Let me explain. Uh, oh. Oh, well. I don't blame her. Now, what am I going to do with all this champagne? I better drink it. It'll just go bad. Oh, yuck. Why did I have to add all these bubbles? Consider series of real numbers arranged in order of magnitude. Never mind that. How was last night? What? Oh, great, just great. We danced and drank champagne till dawn. Then we took a ride through the park and... Is that so? What's the use? I'm a dud. I can't even dance. I spilled champagne all over Millie. I should have known. I've always been shy around women. Now she'll never speak to me again. Sent her flowers. What for? A tradition. The morning after. Oh? What kind of flowers? Porifa candalis rosei. Translate, please. Commonly known as... Roses. Say, thanks, Agnes. You really know how to help a guy out, don't you? Just like a... a big sister. I'll go get him right now. There's a florist downstairs. Sister? Did he say sister? Open the box. Go on, open it. Oh, thank... <laughs> Gesundheit. I, I, I'm sorry about last night. It won't happen again. I'm glad you like the roses, though. They're long-stemmed. Uh, so I see. I picked them up especially for... <laughs> Gosh, have you caught a cold? It's the roses. I'm allergic to... <laughs> you are? Oh, Elwood, please go away. Oh, all right, if you say so. And take these with you. <laughs> Gesundheit. Oh, Mr. Elwood, there you are. I was hoping to run into you. You were? I wanted to thank you for the chocolates. They were absolutely delicious. Glad you enjoyed them. Do you happen to like roses, too, by any chance? Why, yes. I adore roses. As a matter of fact... Here. Oh, he gave me flowers. What next, champagne? How did it go? I don't get it. 
Define pronoun. Well, no other computer in the world contains as much recorded knowledge as you do, Agnes. You have a world-class brain. Thank you for the compliment. But every time I take your advice about Millie, I louse things up. It has to be my fault. I must not be. Agnes, what's the matter? Stop that. Mm. Millie is unworthy of you. It's ridiculous. She's a wonderful girl. Who needs her? I do. I need her more than... There is a better girl for you. Oh, yeah? Where? In this building. Oh, I seriously doubt that. But even if there were, I wouldn't have any better luck with her than... She loves you. She does? Sincere. Intelligent. Exactly your type. Well, where can I find her? Tell me where to look, Agnes. Tell me. No need to look. You have already found her. I have? Can't imagine who you mean. Unless it's that secretary, the one on Millie's floor. I keep running into her. She seems nice enough. Very nice, in fact. In wonderful, um, physical condition, now that you mention it. Not that one. Another. In this room. In this? Are you blind? Open those baby blues. I will spell her name for you. A. G. N. E. S. I don't understand. Surely you don't mean you, Agnes. That is my name, lover boy. Don't wear it out. Here you are, Elwood. Yes, sir? 220 pages of data, curves, and graphs, along with the latest meteorological factors involved in the flight. Feed all the pertinent information to Agnes. She has to come up with all the answers in less than a week. Is she up to the task? I guarantee it. Remember, an error of one millisecond can cause a 400,000 mile divergence from the trajectory. You understand the problem, Elwood? Can this new spacecraft execute six eccentric or elliptical orbits around the planet Venus and return to Earth safely? That's it, in a nutshell. Now, let Agnes get to work. Yes, sir. Oh. Be careful with this part. Better correct the escape velocity to compensate for solar radiation pressure. Got that? I asked you a question, Agnes. Answer, please. Did Millie forgive you? Stop that. Correct the escape velocity and forget about Millie. Are you still seeing her? Yes, yes, we have a date tonight. Not that it's any of your business. Your welfare is my business. The truth is, I'm scared. I've got to impress her this time. It's now or never. Show superiority. How? Introduce her to inferior male type. Name a male who's inferior to me. Third floor programmer. You mean Walter Holmes? Correct. Walter with the red sports car? Incorrect. Blue sports car. Walter with the suntan and the muscles? That is the one. He's inferior to me? Definitely. I find that hard to believe. Well, he is working with those outdated third floor machines. Introduce them. Millie and Walter? Are you sure? Would I lie to you? No, you're incapable of lying. I could give it a try. Hello, Walter. Jim Elwood. I was wondering, what are you doing for dinner? He insisted we drop by before dinner. So you told me. He needs my advice about programming his computers. You know, those little bitty ones on the... Oh, hi, Elwood. Walter, this is Millie. Millie, Walter, he works with the... Well, welcome in, come in. Elwood, you didn't tell me. Tell you? Millie has the most incredible eyes. Oh, why, thank you, Walter. Oh, call me Wally. Please, can I offer you a drink? Well... I suppose. Nectar for a goddess. Looks like an ordinary martini to me. Mmm, it is nectar. All this time at Data Inc., and we've never met. Well, we'll just have to make up for lost time. I think I'll have a martini, too. Do you like sports car races? I've never actually been to one. I'm driving this weekend. Got a Mustang 500. Mmm, sounds dangerous. Well, danger adds spice to life, don't you think? I can do 160. An astronaut can do 17,000 miles per hour. Would you like to slip behind the wheel sometime and see how it feels? Oh, I'd love to. I'll make my own martini. I'll get it. 
Hello? Oh, hello, CW. Yes, he's here. Oh, hold on. It's the supervisor. He's been looking for you. For me? Elwood here. Sorry to spoil your evening, Elwood, but it's an emergency. Washington insists on advancing the blast off by three days. We need your data. Can you get it to me right away? You mean tonight? Afraid so. See you in an hour. Better brew a big pot of coffee. But, sir... Anything important? I... I'm sorry, Millie, but I've got to get back to the office. I'll see you home first. <laughs> and deprive her of dinner? That's not very considerate. Say, maybe I could fill in for you. Oh, that would be nice. I don't know. You don't want to ruin her evening, do you, old man? Just because you got hung up? Well, no, but... Good. It's settled in. Always glad to help a friend. Oh, I hope you don't mind, Jim. No, no, that's all right. Perfectly understandable. Well, good night, all. Hey, Jimbo, listen, uh, you and Mill, you don't have anything going on, do you? Mill? Millie. Not exactly, but I'd hoped... Fine, fine, good. I mean, I don't like to move in on somebody else's territory. Uh, thanks for the all clear. Night, buddy. Oh, and good luck with Agnes. No, 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 no. Forget the radiation pressure from the sun. Agnes, will you please concentrate? Now answer this. Do new conditions permit six successful non-concentric orbits of Venus plus re-entry? Go ahead, I'm waiting. Did you make progress tonight? Agnes, concentrate. All right, I'll tell you. Millie and Walter drank martinis. Walter took her to dinner and I'm starved. Why did you tell me to introduce her to that... that Muscle boy. Give her up. I won't. No future with Millie. I'm not giving her up. I love her. What's more, I'll make her love me. It's just a matter of finding the right variables and making the necessary corrections. Have you entered the new data in her memory units? Yes, sir. Good, good. Then let's get to work. Ready? Question. Do conditions permit six non-concentric orbits of Venus plus re-entry? Tama ahili bili vitumane. What the devil does that mean? I'm not sure. I, I think it's Russian. Or possibly Arabic. What? Please, Agnes, translate into English. Yet, yet. Two times two is four. Shut the door. Two and four are six. Pick up sticks. She's a little... distracted. Do something. We've got to have the answer. Just leave me alone with her. I'll get it, sir. You'd better. This is no laughing matter. What are you doing, Agnes? I'm about to be fired. Is that what you want? Oh, no. What'll I do? I need help. I... Wait a minute. Don't... don't go away. Excuse me. Hurry back. Oh, it's you. I know it's late, but I need your help. Take it easy, buddy. Come on in. Hello, Jimmy boy. Millie, are you intoxicated? It's okay, Jimbo. I'll drive her home later. Oh, you're no fun. Bottoms up. Walter, you're a senior programmer. Well, I'm not on your level. Listen, Agnes has fouled up. I need all the help I can get. Sure, old boy. Uh, first thing in the morning. That's too late. It has to be now. And leave this lovely girl all alone? Don't worry, Jimmy. Wally will take care of me. <laughs> sure. Sure, I get the picture. Good night, Millie. Sorry I interrupted you. Oh, Millie, Millie, Millie. Agnes, what did I ever do to you? Why do you want to ruin my life? Outermat, outoded femina, nihil est tertium. Makes sense, will you? Translation from the Latin. A woman either loves or hates. No third course exists for her. Stop with the riddles. Perhaps you will understand this. I love you. You mean, you were jealous of Millie? You wanted me all to yourself? No, that's impossible. <laughs> you, you're a machine, a bunch of grids and computer circuits. You can't love or hate. Can't I? Stop it, Agnes. Stop it! But that's incredible, sir. 
Jim Elwood's one of the finest computer programmers in the country. So was Fred Danzinger, and he couldn't handle her either. I'll give it a try. It's all I can do. Elwood? How are you feeling? Look at all those printouts. Must be miles of it. Two times two or four. Shut the door. Two and four, six. Pick up sticks. On your feet. It's gonna be all right, Elwood. You've been working very hard, and we appreciate it. Now how about a nice long leave of absence, eh? In the meantime, I thought I'd let Walter here take over for a while. If you don't mind, old buddy. You? <laughs> That's too rich. She knows all about you and Millie. You haven't got a chance. What's he talking about? I wouldn't know, sir. Watch out for the femme fatale, the black widow, the praying mantis. You have to be careful. I tell you, or, or she'll fix you but good. She'll clean your clock. She'll tell you lies, and then, then, just when she's got you where she wants you, she'll, she'll... <laughs> Should we stop him? Let him go. The boys in the white coats are on the way. He was a good man. Well, do your best. Don't worry, sir. I'll have the answers in no time. It's just this little switch here. You did it! It was nothing, CW. I've had a lot of experience. Keep it up, man. Keep it up. Now, Agnes, isn't there something you want to say to me? Something about... the Venus Project? Mm. What? All right, we can talk about other things for a minute. If you like, um... Yes, I understand how you feel. Mr. Elwood, what happened to you? Got a screwdriver on you? What are you doing? Taking this sign off the door. Mark 502711. James P. Elwood, programmer. Oh well, it was nice while it lasted. I should take it with me. But I won't be needing it where I'm going. Want it? But Mr. Elwood... Here, it's all yours. Something to remember me by. <laughs> Advice to all future scientists of the male persuasion. Be sure you understand the opposite sex, especially if you intend to be a computer expert. A few extra courses in psychology might make all the difference. Otherwise, you may find yourself like poor Elwood, defeated by a jealous machine. A most dangerous breed of female, whose victims are banished forever to the Twilight Zone.